Okay, welcome back to live coverage. This is Silicon Angle's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host in this segment, Jeff Kelly from Wikibon.org, analyst from open source content. Go to Wikibon for free research. Go to Silicon Angle for the latest and greatest reference point in tech innovation. Our next guest, Gary Bloom, the president and CEO of MarkLogic, former Oracle executive, uh, industry luminary. Been, in the, been around the block a few times. Seen a few cycles in the past of the uh, computing revolution. Uh, welcome to The Cube. Thank you, glad to be here. Um, we're just having a little glory day reminiscing about the <laughs> old days, and we didn't even talk about, Ver you are Veritas too, right? Uh, early was, on, yeah, yeah Veritas. Yeah, these, these are big companies that were born out of innovation opportunities in these cycles that come out. Um, so you're now new to MarkLogic, 18 months in the job, you've been at Oracle, you know what's going on. MarkLogic had a peek into the future uh, with their history. Describe why you, you were there, what attracted you to MarkLogic, and 18 months in the job, what has been your core uh, focus and what do you see going forward? Wow, one, one nice short question to get started with. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so the short answer is why, why am I there? Yeah, Mark Logic's a really interesting technology company. And when, when I look for jobs and roles, as I've done earlier in my career, I look for companies that can make a fundamental difference in the way computing's done in the world. And I believe that Mark Logic's in a position to do that. Yeah, you know, I characterize it sometimes as we focus heavily on the 80% of the world's data that today is not in a traditional database. The reality is we focus on that 80%, but we also do a lot with the traditional data and the relational databases as well. And so what I saw at MarkLogic was an opportunity to have a product that had an established customer base in a really important space, solving very interesting, complex technical challenges in a new market. Yeah, we've seen this in the big data world in particular, like I was talking with the founders of Cloudera and Hortonworks, where both at Yahoo, web presence company, they had to invent their own systems because no one else had anything. And on the uh, database side, you know, it's been this cycle of SQL to no SQL over the years, and then 9-11 you know, hits, it's not a relational issue anymore, it's a different data model. So, what, talk about the, what Mark Logic did that was innovative, that put them on the map, and what, what carries them here and what is going to be the enablement for the next level for, their, for the company? Right, so, so it's, it's interesting, you, you, you mentioned the 9-11 st stage and what the intelligence agencies had to do with the data. If you think back to that era, the complaint the intelligence agencies had is, you know, given 9-11 is you had all the data but you didn't do anything with it. And arguably they were correct, um, and you, but if you look at it and you say, well why was that the case? The database technology of the day didn't allow them to do anything with it. So in that funny sense of you could put it in a database, you just couldn't do anything with it. And that's essentially what relational databases became really good at doing. And it's, it's part of the ongoing sales strategy of the relational guys today is to get out there and say, hey, you can put it all in Oracle. You can put it all in DB2. And technically they're correct, as long as you don't want to do anything with that data. But if you actually want to do something with all that data, then you actually need to put that data into a database that was designed and built to process data that doesn't have predefined structure. And if you think about what intelligence agencies deal with, they're in data sharing agreements, they're in agreements where lots of video data, lots of voice data, data of all different kinds and formats come together, and the ultimate thing they're trying to do is they have the find it problem. I have to go into all this data, the big data, and find it, find that nugget of information that's so important for the future. And that's what we helped them do. And that's why we became so successful in that sector. We did the same thing in the publishing sector, by the way. The publishing sector, everything was digitizing. If they didn't find a new way to manage their content, they're going to go out of business. And you look at the document management systems of the past, what do they do? They manage documents. They manage blobs of data called documents. What do we do? We manage the content within the documents. I think it's much more interesting to search within the document than to search for a document. I like to know what's in it. Right, so let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, you know, your statement that really you can get all this data into your Oracle or your IBM database, but you can't do a lot with it once it's there. So you're talking about the content with inside of documents with other unstructured types of text. Um, talk a little bit about some of the constraints that you have in that traditional relational world and specifically how you guys overcome that. And what's interesting is that, you know, we know SQL is a hot topic now, but you guys have been around for uh, you know, for over a decade. So right. I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit about, uh, I know you've only been with the company for 18 months, but I'm, I'm curious, you know, how, did Mark Logic see something that the rest of the, the market didn't yeah. uh, ahead of time? Yeah, so, so that what's, what's interesting is our founder, when he started the company, he was a search expert. And he looked out there and he said, gee, there's all this data in corporations that needs to be searchable, you need to be able to look at, 
So he set about to build a search engine to go search all that data. And what he realized pretty quickly as he started building a search engine, that if you actually want to be able to look at that data through a search engine, you actually have to store it differently. Mm. And he started building technologies, which ultimately became a database, to store the data differently so he could search it effectively. And, and that's what he did with the technology. So his, his initial vision was search engine, so just as Google had started searching the web, he wanted to do the same thing for corporate data and be able to search this vast array of corporate data and so he built the database to go along with it. And as we were talking about a second ago, the early adopter of that became the publishing sector and government intelligence. If, if we drill down, we say, well, what's the fundamental technical difference between the two technologies? Right. The main fundamental difference is we don't have a schema. We do not have to do this pre-existing data map that maps out and knows what data is in each column of the database. I just ingest all the data as it currently is, and I make it all searchable. Yeah, that, that, so, making it so discoverable I, is very key. Right. But what are the innovations that people don't look at, don't actually think top of mind of making that happen? Because pouring a lot of data into a ingestion, is, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, I'll take video from surveillance, I'll take a bunch of data from databases, data exhaust from mobile phones, and then, no, no schema, again. How do you make it discover? What is the core innovation that makes that happen? The, 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 the core innovation is we index all that data as we're ingesting it. So we make it searchable. So the data doesn't have to have structure coming in. We'll create the structure dynamically in, in, the, in the technology itself. And so we do create that structured format. And if, if you fast forward and you say, okay, well the early adopters were government intelligence and, finance, and publishing, today we're selling in very traditional places. We're, you know, just, the, you know, our most recent transaction was with a global financial services company, Global yeah. Bank, doing trading information. Healthcare's hot right and now. And healthcare's hot. We, we yeah. power the Obama Healthcare Exchange. So the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, the healthcare exchange is powered on MarkLogic. And you say, well, why would they have built something like that on MarkLogic? The reason is, if you think about all the insurance information and all the data coming from all these different insurance companies, they do not have an agreed to format. They don't have an agreed to database. Some of them keep it in files, some of them keep it in Oracle, some of them keep it in DB2, some of them use Sybase. They use all different kinds of database technologies. If I'm using all these different kinds of database technology, so what were they to do if they had to bring it all together into a common marketplace so that every citizen of the US can search for healthcare insurance? They'd have to agree on a common format. You yeah. and I, all of us on yeah. doing this interview right now, we'd all be 150 years old <laughs> before we got all the insurance agencies to agree on a common format. I would argue the same is true in intelligence. Getting all the intelligence agencies to agree on common formats for all the data around the globe, we'd be 150 years so old. So obviously it's software is a key driver in all this. Obviously you're hearing that from day one, IP and the software, all new techniques. But also it's a confluence of the innovation in the hardware. We've seen flash, we were just talking about in-memory earlier. What's the, what are those key balancing between the innovations in infrastructure, cloud, uh, how would you weight that 80, 20, 50, 50, 60, 40 were the innovations and really enabling that because you know, you've got amazing compute available now. You have in memory, persistent, basically flash, which can act like RAM. It's changing the, the software paradigm a bit. Schema list databases on top of, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you weigh that? Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, no, it's a great question. So you think about the schema list database on top of a scale out architecture with unlimited amounts of low cost memory. Yeah. And you yeah. go, yeah. well that could be a recipe for success or it could be a recipe for disaster. And the way we make it a recipe for success is all those enterprise things you had to do with your traditional relational database, you don't throw those out. So think back, what made Oracle popular 15, 20 years ago, or 20, 25 years ago, I guess now. <laughs> I'll age myself a little bit. You know, when, when I started Oracle, we had to bring in all the characteristics of the mainframe into the Oracle environment. And you look today, what does Oracle do? It runs in mission critical database environments, core financials, core, core manufacturing, core HR systems. People run their businesses on this technology. When we talk about the NoSQL world and we talk about all this unlimited scalability of storage and memory and data, it's the same thing. You still need all those enterprise capabilities. That's how Mark Logic in that market, that's how we differentiate ourselves from all the open source players. Our target market is not two guys and a dog in a garage building a website. Our target market is corporations and large enterprises around the globe that need high availability. And the integration is a big part. Need, need integration, need compartmentalized security. 
need all those things necessary to build mission critical so applications. So this is the decade where the silos will be broken down and it's, yes, everyone's been hoping for like two decades. I mean, that scale out gives the enterprise a large opportunity to integrate and break down those silos. Well, it's, it's, and it's not solely that they want to break down the silos. They have to. <laughs> they have to break down the silos. Yeah, you know, the government intelligence agencies figured out they had to break down the silos to do good intelligence work. If I look in the global financial services industry, what did the regulators do to that industry? They said, you're going to run all operations of your banks independently. They're not going to talk to each other. So they went out and chose eight or 10 different technologies, each of the banks independently. Now they've come in with the Dodd-Frank Act and regulations, mm -hmm. said, but we're going to regulate you as a single entity. Do you think I have to break down those stove pipes in a global bank? I have to bring all the data together from multiple different entities bring it all into a database and be able to do the same right. kinds of things I've been able to do. With, with no security holes. With no security <laughs> holes and compartmentalized security. Right. And yeah, it, Jeff, it, jumping in here. And right. it does change, would you agree, the, the fundamental way the organization looks at data, because now you've got, uh, if you've got access to all your data, now you can do things that you couldn't do in the past because you've, you can be broken down these silos. You've got to change your expectations of, of users about what right. they can do. Um, and it's really an education effort, I think. Um, so how do you go about helping customers both understand some of the new capabilities and also you know, build the applications on top because ultimately, you know, MarkLogic is a great database, but you, you need applications on top to surface that data. Right. Um, how do you kind of tackle those two, uh, two challenges, education and actually building applications that are going to solve business problems? Yeah, so, so I, I would say we're largely prevailing on the education side. We have you know, well in excess of 350 enterprise class customers that have built out mission critical applications. You know, and we, we talked about the FAA, we talked about Center for Medicare, Medicaid. Um, I have a global financial services company, they run their derivatives trade store on MarkLogic. Um, yeah, I have, so I have government agencies, publishers around the globe that have standardized on our technology. So we, we've largely kind of dealt with some of the education. The part that people don't realize yet is that the time to results in this new technology are materially different and materially better than the time to results with traditional relational technology. So think about what I have to do if I want to build an application in Oracle or in DB2. I spent two years doing a data model. <laughs> right. I don't have to do a data model. The projects where we've replaced failed Oracle implementations, <laughs> we come in after a year of trying yeah. to get the data to work in Oracle, and in eight weeks we do a proof of concept in eight weeks, that proof of concept yeah. largely becomes the application. Yeah, yeah. That, that is the FAA's emergency mm -hmm. operations And they're network. doing it, a lot of them are doing it in Amazon and then it's just rolling it into a private cloud and with a fully integrated stack, mm -hmm. home, well not homegrown, but like right. off the shelf. Um, with that, I want to pivot on that outlook for Mark Logic because that is a trend. You're seeing the new developers come in, not necessarily that savvy on Java. They don't, they've never installed a Linux patch before. They go into Amazon, they're seeing the environment where, hey, I want to do some node on the front end with Rails. I can just have a full stack underneath it all completely automated, a, AKA DevOps. Now you're seeing a developer market that is, wants to be more agile like that. So um, the enterprise has kind of been a slow, <laughs> anemic environment where not a lot of muscle in the development right. area. Mostly homegrown apps, big fat apps, kind of derivative from the mainframe days. What does the enterprise need to do from a development standpoint and what are you guys doing in there? Because at the end of the day, it's train, the, train them how to build their own apps and enable them to do it on their right. own. Well, I, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to get them past their, their biases for the technology of the past. You know, I, I, I sometimes joke when we're selling against Oracle, what am I really selling against? I'm selling against the union that supports the hundreds of thousands of DBAs that manage Oracle databases. Because in this next generation database technology, their job's not the same. My DBA workload for MarkLogic is about a half of a DBA to 10 DBAs for a similar Oracle application. So that's nine and a half jobs that are going away. They go to that agile development yeah. environment, go to that idea that says, let me build things of value, instead of just sitting here restructuring schemas and rebuilding databases and adding indexes for a living. And that's you saw that in the mainframe, they clutched onto their, we, to their, we, their we, service we contracts, and, and then finally client service just broke that, broke that through, and some guys kind of clinged on, but ultimately they end right. up right. shedding their jobs anyway. Well, I was at Oracle through many of those years, <laughs> and I was a mainframe guy by trade. <laughs> in fact, I ran the mainframe division at Oracle. That was my first job, <laughs> first major job at Oracle. And, and you know, that division as fast as possible. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it, it was a funny division, because what we did is we influenced Oracle on what do mainframe customers need to get off. <laughs> that was our primary value. We didn't, we 
so, so the lot of software but not enough to sustain. And, and what, what's, what's funny about it though, is you look and you say, hey, 10 years later, 15 years later, roll the clock forward now, 25, 30 years later, people are still building mainframe applications. Mm -hmm. They're still doing it. So there's a class of applications that still belong on the mainframe. There's also a class of applications that still belong on traditional relational. So you're tra very traditional ERP systems. You know, I had a, a gentleman from a government agency come up to me at an event and said, well, I'm so unhappy with Oracle, can you swap it out and put MarkLogic under my SAP implementation? And my comment to him is that'd be using the wrong tool the opposite way. You know, just as, just as Oracle was never designed to do what we do, we were never, you know, essentially, MarkLogic was not designed to do what Oracle does. Where are those DBA jobs going? Because that's, that's a really amazing statistic. You know, half a DBA for 10 Oracle DBAs, and that's significant. We're seeing all the consistent message across the board. Um, is it data science? Is it analyst role? Or is it more DevOps? Some people are set up for DevOps, some aren't. Where do you see that shift moving to? Well, some, some of them are retiring out of the industry <laughs> just as mainframe guys have retired out. Yeah. Yeah, okay, it's a 25-year-old so trend. Yeah, so so they, I, get they lot, I, get, I get lots of LinkedIn connections from people that <laughs> I worked with at Oracle in the early <laughs> years that are well retired. And, but a lot of it is going to the data scientists and the data analytics. It, the, the model is switching from, if I can build applications really quickly, what do I get to switch to? I get to switch to what's the value of my data and extracting knowledge out of data, making data into information. And ultimately when you net it all out and you say, well, what does MarkLogic do for a living? We take all this data and we make it, we take all this data and we make it into information that's valuable for an enterprise, mm -hmm. whatever that enterprise may be. We do it at an extremely low cost. So uh, last question, we're running close on time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, so as we talked about before the segment, we've uh, here at Wikibon, we've done our big data market sizing. MarkLogic has come out on top in the NoSQL space, um, but you've got a lot of very hungry, very innovative companies uh, you know, making a push, like companies like uh, MongoDB, formerly TenGen, and others. So what do you, as a relatively uh, old and established company in, in a relatively young market, what are you going to do, what do you need to do to keep innovating, to keep those competitors at bay? So ultimately, if you believe that enterprises that are building enterprise class database applications, if you believe that they ultimately need high availability, disaster recovery, security, and, and even little things like transactional consistency, the idea that when I update data, I don't lose it. If you think any of those things are important, the reason we're as big as we are and the reason on your chart, if you add up all the other NoSQL players, you get a number smaller than MarkLogic. The reason is, is because we solve the enterprise class problem. We provide all the security availability that enterprises need to truly use new technology. No different than Oracle had to do before Oracle had a major impact on the mainframe market. Mm -hmm. We had to build in at Oracle when I was there. We had to add all that enterprise capability. MarkLogic has arguably a four or five year lead on the enterprise capabilities that every IT shop in the world needs to have. Mm -hmm. My final question for you is, as a legend in the industry, well-known, multiple business cycles, MarkLogic, great opportunity for you, obviously taking the helm there. What's the, what's the vision? Where are you going to take that bus in terms of where you see the company going? What are the op market opportunities, obviously, large enterprise, big market, um, big data, converged infrastructure, what's your vision, and where are you going to take the company? Yeah, so, so the, it's kind of a funny question, because we're, if you think about the big data market, we're kind of in the, the first, maybe the second inning of the big data market, and we have an opportunity to, to win the World Series of the, of the big data market. And so, the goal here is build a big successful company. We're solving real IT problems with 80% of the world's data that's not in an Oracle database, not in a DB2 database. We do a lot with the, the data that isn't very structured and relational, so we can kind of process all of a company's data and make it immensely valuable to the enterprise. I think that creates an opportunity for a company of significant value. More importantly for me, my real interest at this stage is, how do I build out a tech technology company that fundamentally makes a difference in the way people think about their data? I've been in the data industry my entire career, and now we're finally going to change it. How do you feel about the team and the composition? Obviously, it's a World Series, it's a long season, 180 games, whatever the games they are now. One, game one now going on. What, what's the, the, uh, the makeup of the team look like? Yeah, so, so we're doing great. We, we have generally, the entire executive team, myself included, this is one of the smaller things any of us have ever done in our career. So we're already ready to be the big company. We're not one of these companies that as we grow, we have to throw everybody out and start all over again. So we have a team on the field that can go dominate and win in the marketplace. 
and show the maturity necessary to sell in the top global financial industry, sell to healthcare, sell to oil and gas. So it's really a matter of, let's take what's been kind of a specialty product in the early phases to a broadly deployed technology across the world. And that's what we're focused on. Gary Bloom, the CEO of MarkLogic, Experience Team, Foundation Set, take it to the next level. MarkLogic, Inside the Cube, great to have you. We'll be right back live from San Francisco. This is the Cube, Oracle Open World 2013 coverage, day one of three days of wall-to-wall -wall live coverage. Be right back. <laughs>